So good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Sam Horgood, and uh, I'm the Chancellor here at UCSF. And on behalf of the UCSF community and our co-sponsoring institutions, Stanford and the University of California, Berkeley, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here to this panel discussion. You're going to hear, I think, three very interesting, provocative, and I dare say philosophic uh, panel discussions here in a few minutes. And I have the singular job of introducing our moderator and host for this evening, uh, Yuri Milner. Uh, Yuri was uh, uh, the individual who helped conceive and found uh, the Breakthrough Prizes, and uh, he is going to moderate the panel here tonight. He's an entrepreneur, a venture capitalist, and a physicist. I'm not sure in which order he would like me to have used those three uh, titles, but he uh, graduated in uh, theoretical physics from Moscow State University in 1985, and then a few years later, uh, I think much to our benefit, did an MBA at the uh, Wharton Business School at the University of Pennsylvania. And in, in that role, he's been enormously successful, and he has uh, brought his uh, vision and passion for basic science and the resources that he's been uh, able to uh, uh, acquire and accumulate uh, to support and enhance uh, excellence in science around the world and also to promote science as a uh, chosen and preferred career path uh, for the next uh, generation. So Yuri, uh, thank you so much for all you do for all of us and uh, I welcome you here now to host uh, what I know will be a very interesting panel. Yes, thank you very much for a very kind introduction, probably too kind. So we have about an hour and 15 minutes to cover three subjects. The theory of everything, <laughs> how long can we live, and the evolution of intelligence. And uh, we have, um, I think, very uh, strong panels, and I would like to Without further ado, invite uh, Andrew Strominger and Kumrun Waffa and Ed Boyden so that we can start with the theory of everything. <laughs> so Ed Boyden is a professor of biological engineering and brain sciences at MIT. He's one of the pioneers of optogenetics, the groundbreaking technique for controlling neurons with light. And Andrew Strominger is a theoretical physicist at Harvard University. He has contributed to numerous advances in string theory and quantum gravity, including groundbreaking work on black holes. And Kumrun Bafa in the middle. Uh, he's a professor in theoretic of theoretical physics at Harvard University as well. He's one of the leading figures in string theory and had has produced many important and original insights into space-time geometry and black holes. Um, with that introduction, Andrew, uh, what is the theory of everything? <laughs> uh, well, of course, we don't know if there is a theory of everything. And I guess it's, we started out uh, with Newton. He had a theory of something, he had a theory of gravity, and I guess the dream of physicists is that we can uh, describe everything, that the laws of physics describe everything. So as the centuries have gone by, we've described more and more. And of course, that leads one to ask, could we ever be able to describe everything? Write down some equations and some laws which described everything in the universe. Uh, we don't know. Certainly trying to find a theory of everything has been a uh, rewarding enterprise, but whether we'll ever get to the end, it strikes me as rather strange to think we could get all the way to the end, but people have different opinions on this. Comron, what do you think? Is there a, like an ultimate description, or you think it's kind of a never-ending quest? Well, <clears throat> I think as Andy said, it's a tough question. Um, it's a bit speculative for me to answer, but um, there is something that we have learned in the past, I would say, 20 years in string theory, which might suggest an answer. 
uh, and that's the subject of dualities. So before the advent of dualities, the viewpoint in particle physics is that you find the fundamental theory <coughs> of particles. What are the basic ingredients of matter and how things are working and what is the basic thing as fundamental entities. One thing we have learned by in the advent of dualities is that that concept is not a natural concept, that what appears to be fundamental from one perspective is not fundamental from a different perspective. And there is no fundamental perspective of what is fundamental. <laughs> so the idea that there is one thing in the context of duality is under question, that there is one nice viewpoint which summarizes things is not apparently correct. Now, this does not necessarily mean that there is no ultimate final theory of the thing, but if there is such a thing, it would not be described necessarily by one thing. That is, just like what we have learned, even the small set of possibilities that we have actually explored, that there's no right viewpoint. Even within that limited set that we understand, there is no right viewpoint, and we think we understand it pretty well, but we know each corner has a completely different description, and no description is better than the other one as a whole. But in each corner, there's one preferred one. Yeah, but do you think there is kind of the end of this road, or do you think it's There could be an end of a road in terms of relation of objects, relation of thoughts, but whether it's not, I, I, I doubt it's gonna be in the form of one single equation or something like that. I would think that it's gonna be a set of perhaps conceptual ideas which fit together in a nice way, and, but which one is the right way to think about it depends on the question you ask. That's the way it appears in the context of dualities. Now, uh, that's the, at least if we want to use dualities as an analogy to what would be the ultimate question that could happen. Yeah, but you can visualize the situation that there is nothing else to discover. It could be like that, but then, then uh, potentially you could say that you could have a framework where you can see all these different areas, different parts are described by different perspectives and they fit together and that how they fit together is that final theory, for example, that could be what perspective. But then uh, I, I'm reminded if we w wanna take really the ultimate theory to describe everything, that's a tall order. And we already know that no logical system can capture everything completely, as uh, if you to point to the, take the point of logical viewpoint, logicians will point to the Godel's incompleteness theorem. So there is no logical consistent set of rules which give you everything in any consistent framework. So any model is incomplete. So, so if you wanna go to that extreme, if you're really asking about complete theory, yeah. then you're, you're hitting against that bound. However, in physics, we are far from that question right now. We are asking much more pragmatic ones because we never ask what is the ultimate theory in the sense that since we are so far away, so. But if you're really asking that question, I would say that that incompleteness theorem will come into a way of having a fundamental final set of axiom dot, 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 as the theory of everything. Okay, uh, Ed, you are one of the best, best scholars of the human brain, and this is what we use to understand the universe. So <laughs> can, you, can you explain how can human brain in principle comprehend the universe? Because I mean, it's not a trivial, Thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, the good news is we haven't comprehended it yet. So, <laughs> but, but a couple thoughts. So one thought is that um, I think it's very important also to think about what do we mean by understanding, uh, and it's become clear uh, from behavioral economics and from neuroscience and psychology that the feeling of understanding might not be the same state as actually understanding, which <laughs> might explain like <laughs> politics, for example. Um, so one of the big questions I think is well. What is making something understandable? You know, and there's a, you know, speaking of girls in completeness um, theorem, there's a related concept called a Kolmogorov complexity, which basically says, how can you take some complex data set or some number or some string and represent it by the shortest possible representation? And so there's a sense in which understanding has a sort of elegance or art to it, right? A very, very long set of, of um, descriptions of matter, although it could be a brute force description, might not be satisfying. And of course, in physics and in all of science, we're always trying to find the most compact and elegant representations of theory in order to, to feel like we're understanding more. So one interesting possibility, oh, and the Kolmogorov complexity, by the way, is not computable. So it also is not something that you can just put into a computer and turn the crank and it'll spit out the theory. So, so then we're really doomed, I'm afraid. Um, on the other hand, though, um, one of the things that's sort of interesting is, you know, is there the capability to couple machines to the human mind to augment our ability to understand. Maybe we don't have an ultimate theory of everything, but could we couple computers, you know, I like to call them brain coprocessors, the idea that, you know, in the years to come, computers that work intimately with the human brain can actually augment our ability to, to 
for example, hold more things in our working memory, the number of things you can kind of hold in mind at once. And this might seem science fiction right now, but I think in the years to come, the way that neuroscience is accelerating, maybe you could actually imagine the ability to um, understand the principles of how things are, are held in mind and maybe you know, build prosthetics that could augment that kind of thing. I mean, we're not, the science is not there yet, um, but you can imagine if we augment our ability to understand, then maybe that could be another way of closing the gap between where we are now and some kind of ultimate theory. Well, Andrew, um, the, the equations that we have are already pretty simple. I mean, there are small number of parameters, whatever the number is, 25 or 15, but it's a small number. W by the way, what is the number? <laughs> <laughs> it's, gr it's grown considerably with neutrinos uh, in the 70s, I think. In the 70s? Okay. But I mean, it's not 25 million. So it's not 25 so it's million. So it's a small set of numbers that explain pretty much everything, maybe with a few exceptions. But... Uh, at the same time, we see a complex world around us and structures and humans. How, how this simplicity, simplicity can lead to complexity? What do you think? Well, there are many... Uh, so in other words, what I'm saying is that it seems like at the small scale, the universe is very simple. At the very large scale, it's also very simple. But there is this intermediate scale with complexity. So how does that happen? Uh, yeah, so I think we're all familiar with how things which start off being very uh, simple become very complicated. Um, just over the holiday, uh, my kids uh, taught me a new game, Spies and Resistance, and the rules were explained to me in 30 seconds. And, uh, oh, well, this is such an easy game. I'll just figure out how you play it. <laughs> And then somewhere in the worst, in the middle of the first hand, I got uh, really, wait, who, what, what, what's the next move I'm supposed to make? And I'm not sure you could solve this game. I think it's <laughs> extremely complicated, even though, uh, even leaving out the psychological elements, just the <laughs> mathematics of it. So it's certainly possible that very complex behavior can, arri can arise uh, from very simple uh, set of equations. Um, that is not uh, so mysterious. Um, it's f finding those simple set of equations. And w one thing I would like to say is that every time you find something new in every field of science is like this, when you answer one question, it, you learn five more. And uh, it's, it's like this in, in biology, it's like this in physics. So I think it was famously said at the turn of uh, the century, uh, the 19th, 20th century, by I think it was Lord Rayleigh, all we have to do is understand the Michelson-Morley experiment. And then we'll have all the laws, we'll have all the laws of physics, just this little experiment. Now, for those of you who don't know, that was the experiment which famously to make sense of it, you needed, Einstein needed to invent the theory of, of relativity. So as we go on, answering old questions leads to new ones at, at a faster rate. So it's my feeling that, that I'm safe. Nobody's going to put me out of business <laughs> by, <laughs> by, by f you know, finding all the theories of, of the universe, and we'll just keep having more and more questions. Yeah, but still. What is not clear to me is that not every simple set of rules leads to complexity. So what is so special about our simple rules that led to us? Well, it's true for many systems with a, a sufficient level of complexity that they, typical systems, with a su sufficient level of complexity, like this rather simple game, which my kids explained to me in less than a minute, uh, led to something very complicated. So uh, certainly the laws of physics, the pieces that we already understand, ha that uh, if we, the parts that we don't understand about our uni physical universe mostly uh, involve gravity uh, the so-called standard model of physics has been just a spectacular success with the discovery of the Higgs boson, very near where, uh, you know, after 50 years of uh, 
of experimental uh, work. But even that part, which where we understand the laws very well, we can see in that part that uh, we get out, you know, protons and we can build life forms out of that. So it, that um, is the fact that simplicity can give rise to complexity is not so puzzling. Nevertheless, there are many interesting challenges in understanding the structure of how that happens. So Qumran, since Andrew is avoiding answering, so what? <laughs> what uh, well, <laughs> I, I think he was, he was answering in some ways, uh, but <laughs> let me just amplify some aspects. First of all, a good example I think where simplicity gives complexity is one, two, yeah. three, four, five, six, number theory. It's very simple, right? You don't need much instruction. You learn it in primary school. And we have number theory mathematicians still working hard at trying to derive some facts about this simple thing. So we already have a very simple thing giving you such a complex behavior. So that's a logical example. Other example, like Andy was mentioning, I would say probably the best example might be the fact that you just take Coulomb force between electron and protons. And that gives you all the life, all the things we know about chemistry, which ultimately leads to all these amazing behavior we see in our life. So already this one over R squared force law gives you all this. So that already shows that both mathematically and physically simple ideas can give you complex ones. Now, your other question of why is it that not, and I agree with you that not every simple rule will give you an interesting complex system. Well, if it wasn't, we would, of course, not be here to answer these questions, and that would be the kind of anthropic kind of approach to answering your question. That is, well, there might be indeed some simple universes, and they'll be boring if they don't lead to complex behavior. So that might be an answer. I don't know. So you mentioned mathematics uh, more than once. So what makes uh, mathemat mathematics specifically so efficient in describing uh, our world? Well, that's a tough question. I guess uh, started with Wigner saying, uh, talking about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in describing reality. Perhaps I would say, um, if you go back to the rule that anything that can happen will happen, if you take that motto as a rule of physics, anything that can happen will happen is a logical statement. I think so Gelman, mathematics. I think Gelman added, and it will happen an infinite number of times. Time. <laughs> and log logical statements are like this. Are the, are the domain of mathematics. Mathematics basically take me everything which is allowed. It studies not just any particular thing, but all consistent things. Physics, if anything that can happen will happen, is part of physics, so they collide. They, 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 they kind of interfere with each other, so it's not surprising that physics will be related to math in this way. So the statement that anything that can happen will happen might be the thing to explain, though. <coughs> so, so another emergence of complexity is, of course, human brain, which emerged from a single cell um, some time ago. So, you know, how did it happen that from simple, uh, well, relatively simple uh, elements, you can build something as complex as human brain? So it's amazing that in many organisms that have no brains, even organisms that are just a single cell, they do basic computations in the sense that they can respond to the environment. You know, bacteria, single-celled algae um, can sense chemicals, can sense light, and have little, uh, you know, flagelli that turn and twitch in order to help them swim around. So if you think of, you know, basic neural responses as sense and then move, uh, there's a huge variety of organisms, you know, plants turn towards sunlight and so forth that don't even need brains to, um, to, to, to help them. And so you might wonder, why do we bother with our brains? And so one idea is that um, you, know, you start putting intermediate elements. You have a sensory input, you have a motor output. Let's put some stuff in between. And if that stuff can you know, store memory, if that stuff can encode context, if it can you know, you know, have state changes that you might call emotion, then there's a lot more complex kind of responses that you can make. And if you look at the evolution of nervous systems, you, know, you see an incredible uh, increase in the number of, of neurons in between sensory inputs and motor outputs. You know, for us, a tiny, tiny fraction of our nervous system is comprised with sensory input and, and motor output. You know, 99.999 or some enormous fraction of our neurons are in between. Um, and it's interestingly, if you look at AI in recent years, with all the excitement about, excitement about deep learning, a lot of that has also been driven by putting more complexity in the so-called hidden layers in between inputs and outputs. And uh, you know, if you go back to you know Marvin Minsky and the perceptron, you know, half a century ago, which couldn't do a whole lot, and they famously wrote a book pointing out all the things that you couldn't do with it. 
you know, that didn't have hidden layers. You could think of that like a very simple nervous system, and many people abandoned uh, the you know sort of neural network models of cognition and, and intelligence in the day. But now with uh, with deep learning, with you know 10, 20, you know more hidden layers, and of course you need lots of data to train that up, which in the case of us, you know, is provided in part by evolution, uh, sculpting our nervous systems as well as you know selecting for brains that are good at certain things and and so forth. Um, you know, these kinds of artificial networks are also, you know, you can almost think of them as evolving over time, uh, over the last 60 years or so, to incorporate more and more of that kind of hidden internal complexity. <coughs> uh, but it's still think it's striking, you know, and, you know, when you look at a bacterium, it can do some pretty clever things. Um, well, the last question I wanted to ask is, in understanding the universe, um, what do you think we can achieve in the next 10, 20 years? Andrew. Um, if you will, just single one thing. Which, ah, what's inside a black hole? Ah? Huh? Well, I do, uh, so, um. What is I inside the black hole? I want to know why you're giving me 10, 20 years when you're taking 30 to go to Alpha Centauri. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I want, if you're going to take 30, I w uh, so I think in 30 years we can understand what's inside a black hole. Okay. Uh, Kumron, what is the most important thing for you that can happen in understanding the universe in the same time frame? Well, it's a scary thing to answer because if I asked this question five years ago from myself, I would have given the wrong answer. Fifteen years ago, again, a wrong answer. And so I, I cannot see myself giving the right answer. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so science, I think, by nature, is so dynamic that if I could tell you what is going to happen, if it's even remote chance of being true, then it would not be very good for science. What, science what would you like to happen? I would like to happen, what I would like to happen is to understand the string landscape really well, understand what are the allowed possibilities, what is not allowed and why, to well, understand what is... Can you not use the word string so that everybody understands? We want to understand what are the allowed possible universes that could, uh, could arise. We, we think from a, concept, from a framework that I study in the context of string theory with my colleagues, we think not everything that you can conceivably imagine arises. Okay, so what arises? Can you give me the full list of all the allowed possibilities? And why? Why are these the full list? If we have a way to frame with that question, we have made amazing progress. We are far from that right now, but we can, we can study examples from string theory to get some hints. So gradually populate this possibility. Hopefully, that's my hope that that will be a good program. What is... Uh Ed, what is achievable in the next 10, 20 years in understanding human brain? So I don't get 30, I have to do 10 and 20. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> well, it's really an exciting time now in neuroscience because um, the, it's, it's become very clear that we need better technologies for mapping the brain, watching the brain in action, controlling the brain. And there's a bit of a renaissance going on right now. You know, there's in the United States this brain initiative, for example, about building new tools to help us raise our game up to the level of complexity of the brain. So one single so. thing. Oh, okay. Well, I think it'd be great to try to make some, you know, physical models of simple organisms. You know, if we could map the activity and the connectivity and so forth of some simple worms and flies and other small critters. Um, you know, if we could have sort of, and you know, this is a, you know, a panel on complete theory we're talking about. I wouldn't say this is a complete theory of all brains, but even solving something small and simple completely, I think. So what do you think is achievable in this time frame in terms of complexity of the organism? Would it be like C. elegans or like a fly or? Yeah, well, so C. elegans has 302 neurons, 6,000-ish connections. Um, we have a, a pretty good rough sketch of the wiring, although it's not complete. And also, we don't know much about the molecules along those wires and at the connection. So that's something we need to fill in. And finally, we have to see the, the worm in action and all of the processing that's occurring. But I think those tools are starting to converge. There are new optical ways to watch neurons act. There are you know, new ways of imaging very fine nanoscale connections. And so if we can start to make, say, differential equation dynamical systems models of the worm, and then try to also come up with more reduced representations that we can actually um, hold in our mind and, and have an intuitive feel that we understand them, uh, and then make predictions that we can test. I think that's something that could happen in the next 10 years or so, perhaps. Thank you very much. So with that, we move to the next panel. How long can we live? So I would ask Stephen Elledge, Roland Nusse, and Ashok Sen to join me here. 
Stephen Elledge is a geneticist at Harvard Medical School and Brigham Women's Hospital. He has made discoveries across an unusually wide range of fields, including cell division, aging, cancer growth, and protein degradation. Roland Nusa is a developmental biologist at Stanford University. He discovered wind pathway and traced its role in embryonic development, stem cell division, tissue regeneration, and cancer. And finally, Ashok Sen is a theoretical physicist at Harish Chandra Research Institute in India. He's one of the central figures in above-mentioned string theory, including landmark work on black holes and links between string theory and quantum gravity. So with that diverse of a panel, we'll try to answer that question. So Stephen, uh, what is aging? How can you describe and maybe define it for our conversation in the next well, uh, yeah, that's a that's a good starting point because it means different things in different contexts. Let um, me specify for complex organisms. So aging simply at the, on the simplest level is th are the changes that occur during your lifetime. And um, this is not to be confused with lifespan, but they're related. And, uh, and then there's, so that's sort of the macroscopic level. And then there's a the microscopic level of what's happening to all of the cells within an organism. Uh, are they all aging at the same rate? Are they collectively causing what appears to be aging in an organism? Uh, and, and what are the underlying mechanisms? Why can't cells be immortal? Why aren't we immortal? Uh, but the, the overall process of changes that occur during lifespan, at least in, um, in animals that are not, quote unquote, immortal, uh, that, would, that would define aging. And, and I also say that there's, there's also some confusion with, with the word immortality because, for example, um, some people think that uh, microorganisms and bacteria which divide by fission are immortal, but, and, and they are in the sense that they're still alive uh, and they, they, they can continue to proliferate, but what you need to do if you wanna measure aging is to take one cell and even as it divides to watch what happens to the cell, the parent cell uh, that initiated that over time. So there's a little confusion in, in how people use the words and the language, um, but there are ways to study that as well. Is it possible to distinguish the parent cell after division? Um, well, I think the, the way to do that is to, um, you can mark or modify the surface of, say, a bacteria or a yeast um, <coughs> with biotin, and you can stick it to a surface. And then all the progeny, it's called a baby machine, and the progeny float off, and you're stuck there, and you can monitor that cell, and it's not leaving. Okay. So that is a way to do that. Roland, uh, this year a paper from geneticists at Albert Einstein College of Medicine claimed that human life expectancy would never rise beyond 125 years. Now others say that genetics will enable us to cure aging. So what do you think? Yeah, let me start by saying that uh, uh, famously uh, Dobzhansky um, said that and nothing in biology makes sense except for in the light of uh, evolution. And uh, if you think about evolution and the replacement of uh, previous uh, generations by uh, generations or species that have been more adapted to uh, the present uh, environment, uh, it seems that we do need a limited lifespan in order to allow evolution to occur. Because if everything and everybody had been uh, hanging around forever, it would be very difficult for subsequent generations to adapt, you may also say uh, progress, although that is slightly different term, <laughs> to, uh, to, the, to the new environment, right? So, so I think that there is indeed a, um, a program, a genetic program that uh, limits our lifespan for a good reason. And so do you do you believe in 125 is a hard limit? 
or 150, yeah, whatever it is. Yeah, I think now, so I, I looked at the paper after the discussion we had uh, yesterday that uh, th the data looked uh, compelling. So what they had been doing is to look at um, uh, populations with different cohorts, different lifespan, and where the largest expansion of that population would occur. And it appeared that a life a group of, let's say, 80 years would in s at a certain time uh, expand more rapidly than other age groups. And then if you look later, a population of 85 would expand more rapidly. But then if you look at those data over time, it reaches some kind of a, 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 a plateau and that there would be no significant increase anymore in lifespan beyond a few cases. Now, uh, of course, everybody focuses on a few cases of people becoming very old, but on the other hand, we have to recognize the human population has exploded over the past 100 years from okay, maybe 1 billion to 7 billion that we have now. So there will, will, there will be an increase in statistical cases where uh, very old people are suddenly uh, coming to rise. So I, I do believe myself that there is indeed a limit uh, to our lifespan. I think it is for a good reason. And uh, I doubt that uh, a significant impact can be made on uh, extending our lifespan. So let me ask Ashok, as he is a physicist, so from the first principles, is it inevitable that complex systems always fail at some point? Well, at least I don't know of any first principle why they should fail. I mean, if we focus on specific uh, uh, beings like human beings, maybe biologists will be in a better position to answer so that it will eventually fail. But if we want to make a general statement, I don't really see why complex systems should necessarily fail. Okay. Of course, there are, I mean, if we think in terms of very long scale, there are natural limits. Like, uh, I mean, eventually on 10 to the 14 years, our galaxies will run out of fuel, right? So that will be the natural end of living beings. Yeah, we'll come back to that. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, uh, Stephen, so, uh, so let's say, we're, let's say we're talking about extension rather than uh, completely solving the problem. Do you think that uh, some sort of editing DNA can help extend uh, human life eventually? Well, um, <coughs> um, first of all, I disagree that there's, gonna f there's a flat limit. And there, there may be for the way we've evolved so far. But had there been different evolutionary pressures, we could live as long as other organisms that live 200, 400 years, uh, in, in some cases, if you count plants. You know, so there is that possibility. And, and it's just a matter that we haven't had the opportunity and lived long enough to select for that. Because until long ago, not that long ago, we were dying at 30 or 40 years old. And there's, you know, what's the selective advantage of living to be 100 if you're going to be eaten before then? Um, <coughs> so in terms of, of you know, can we edit ourselves somehow? And I think it's clear from looking at other organisms that lifespan studies have been done in, and work from Cynthia Kenyon and Gary Rovkin and uh, Seymour Benzer and others have shown that you can get mutations in these organisms that extend their lifespans, model organisms, significantly. And those would uh, be mice or fly? Well, or those were flies, but that, that doesn't matter because this now we're finding similar things in mice. And it started with caloric restriction, you know, extending lifespans. It hasn't been shown to really do that in humans yet. I don't know if, if caloric restriction, if you live longer, it just seems longer. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. So it's, it's worth it. But, but it's clear that um, there are uh, certain mutations in, in dogs live much longer. And so you could clearly edit that. And it gets to be a problem of how many different ways can you impact aging. So, um, you know, it's clear that it's a part of it is a homeostasis problem of protein folding and toxicity. And you can improve uh, protein folding and clearance uh, of things like, you know, and, and there are genes that turn off when you get older. There's accumulation of senescent cells, which most recently w there was an experiment where you could kill senescent cells in mice uh, after the fact, and they would, they would live 30% longer. So all of these things together, you can start adding them up. And, and there's, a, there's a brilliant geneticist at MIT, Angelica Iman, um, who um, showed that in uh, yeast, and I think this may be true 
uh, and other organisms, and people are certainly looking at it. There's a way to, to uh, restore immortality to a yeast cell. So, and, and that's by going through the process of meiosis, which we do too. So we're old, and, our, uh, and we're old when we have offspring, but our offspring are young. They're not like us. And, and so there is a cleansing process of older cells. And as she showed by just turning on one transcription factor that activates part of a meiotic program, that you could, you could extend the lifespan of a, of a yeast cell indefinitely by continuing to do that. You know, so can we regenerate our own cells that way? Is there a way to do that? Uh, I think that's, that's not a, a, a trivial thing to do, but it's certainly a possibility. So I'm absolutely certain that we could do set up genetic circuits or remove genes. Uh, the genes are often needed for things early and different things later, so you can't necessarily take them away from a baby, but you can turn them off um, in us. So I'm, I'm convinced that we could expand the, the lifespan of humans far beyond 115 or 125 years. But uh, let me ground the discussion just for another few minutes. What exactly has been proven without doubt or be unreasonable doubt to be working in humans to extend lifespan when you already today well i think the mediterranean diet uh is probably one of the better ones uh but no drugs yet i mean the, unless you know in terms take of NAD, uh, in, but in terms <laughs> of lifestyle what has been convincingly proven well i i think um well you see lifespan or average life length of life and I think there are certain things that are going to improve the average uh, length of life. Of course, you know, after you remove the fact that if you quit shooting people when they're young, yeah. the average uh, age of a population will increase. Uh, but but um, w if you want to talk about actually lengthening the actual lifespan. Or a given individual. Or a given individual. Well, if you don't die of heart disease because you take statins, that lengthens your life. If you have a healthy lifestyle and you eat right or, you know, versus you don't smoke, I mean, all these things add up for any individual, but does it, ma it makes them live longer, but maybe not extend their life, the maximum lifespan. Uh, but I do think you can. Okay, do so that. statins and diet. And not Anything smoking. Anything else? Not smoking. Those are the top Exercising. three. Exercising. Four. Okay. <laughs> all right. Roland, can you, do you want to add something to this list? What can extend the uh, individual life? Well, no. What, what have been convincingly I proven? Uh, I, I don't know of anything that has been proven. I do know about the study of uh, the, the Mediterranean diet. That was a prospective study that was very uh, convincing because most other studies are retrospective and don't compare uh, similar uh, groups. The, the, the other point I want to bring up with respect to aging and um, um, lifespan is that th there is a risk um, of increasing the, let's say, the lifespan of certain cells, the stem cells that I was talking about today, in the propensity of those cells to turn into cancer cells. Uh, I was actually excited today to see data on the expression of a gene called P16 Inc. Uh, that increases uh, over time in cells. And this is a tumor suppressor gene. So um, as we age, the expression of P16 ink goes up, and it probably leads to senescence of the cells. Now, at the same time, when you remove the gene, you increase the likelihood of getting cancer in a very significant way. So there's probably a balance between uh, our ability to uh, live longer or to age uh, in a better way and the likelihood that we develop cancer. So, as everything, there's, an, there's a trade-off between extended lifespan of cells and the replicative ability of a cell and the propensity of those cells to turn into cancer cells. And we do know that there has been also evolutionary pressure on not getting cancer. We know this from a lot of data. So, again, I want to bring up today the, the argument that evolution has selected us in um, a very complex way uh, for a limited uh, lifespan that would optimize the, uh, the, the let's say, the, the, the propagation of our genes, which is ultimately uh, what evolution selects for. All right. Um, 
I think at some point I will ask the last question on this panel. It will probably be Steven because he is intrinsically more optimistic, but it's okay. <laughs> uh, Ashok, uh, if we if we move further out and start talking about very long-term projections, um, so uh, Freeman, Dyson, uh, and some others uh, uh, famously argued that. Um, as the universe progresses and uh, as the stars die and so on, you can prolong uh, intelligence indefinitely with using kind of lower and lower energy. Um, can you comment on this? So in other words, as the energy in the universe runs out, can we continue to exist? Okay, yeah, so maybe I should first briefly recall uh, Dyson's argument, what his proposal was. So the idea is that if you are living in an ambient temperature, say T, then you need a certain amount of energy to, say, create one thought. That's, that's the way he said, that the lower temperature means you need less energy because you have to uh, overcome less barrier. So what he suggests is that suppose you are living in some temperature T and you have a certain amount of energy E, you use half of that energy to have a thought, okay, and then you go into hibernation. Okay. And then the expansion of the universe cools down the uni uh, universe. Okay. The temperature comes down, and when the temperature has come down sufficiently low, you perform your next thought. You come out of hibernation and perform your next thought, but now you use half of the energy that you already have, which means it's one quarter of the original amount of energy. And then you again go into hibernation. Okay. You let the universe cool down, and then you, you use it again. And this way, you can have infinite number of thoughts, okay? even though you, have, you start with a finite amount of energy because the temperature of the universe is coming down. Okay. Unfortunately, that idea doesn't work anymore with our present knowledge of the universe because we know that the universe is accelerating. And in an accelerating universe, there is a limiting temperature, okay, which you cannot go beyond that. So as the universe expands and it cools, it reaches a limiting temperature. And once you reach a limiting temperature, then you know that you always have to spend a fixed amount of energy for every thought. And then you will sooner or later run out of the amount of energy that you started with. Okay. So yes, his argument could have worked if the universe didn't accelerate. But in the presence of acceleration, that, does, that doesn't work anymore. And that's because of the discovery of uh, Saul Perlmutter, who is sitting yes. here, uh, that now we know that this trick will not work. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> So what is the time frame of, uh, of uh, what is the time scale of this phenomena really taking hold? Which well, puts limit on everything and life. Yeah, the point is that, I mean, we know that with our current uh, uh, system of stars, we can probably live at least till 10 to the 13 years because that's the lifespan of the low mass stars. And if we give some accidental, uh, I mean, cases, maybe we can live up to 10 to the 14 years just based on the standard uh, uh, idea of life, okay, which is that you go around the star and then you live there by extracting energy from the star. And in 10 to the 14 years, you already would have reached this limit. Okay, the temperature of the universe will already be saturated by the, uh, uh, this what we call uh, the, uh, the, uh, the DC temperature or this limiting temperature would have already been reached. So then, I mean, you cannot really use his argument to prolong life any further. Okay beyond what we just expect from standard considerations. Um, now, uh, just going back to where we are and uh, looking at the slightly shorter time horizon, Stephen, do you think that uh, we, if we cannot solve the problem of organic uh, immortality, maybe we can use uh, sort of non-organic way to prolong our existence? So do you believe in sort of a post-organic uh, uh, life and evolution? Meaning silicon and artificial intelligence and that sort of thing. Ultimately, I think Sam Harris had a really interesting discussion at this point 
that that um, our contribution to to the universe may be to actually make intelligent machines that will then overcome. Oh, sorry about that. That that may then you know. Yeah. It go beyond the human race. And once, and there's nothing special, I hate to say this, but there's nothing really magical about our brains that you couldn't eventually build a computer to mimic uh, just as well. And, and, and you don't have to be uh, that much better as a computer because you're just so much faster at calculating. So you can imagine a computer taking the place of, say, uh, you know, five Stanford scientists and, uh, and, and a couple of... Uh, in a couple of months, doing 70,000 years worth of research, you know, because it can work a thousand or a million times faster than our brains can. So then, you know, if they learn how to, or we teach them how to build themselves, they could begin to evolve. And, uh, you know, there have been movies about this, <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, you know, it's, it's quite possible that they would then, then begin experiencing evolution. Now, they won't have the sort of emotional constraints that we've had that, you know, we needed to, to survive uh, that this, those sorts of circuits initially, but they might get them. So, you know, if, if the answer is, do I think that, that uh, we will evolve into a species that is really silicon-based, I think that will inevitably happen. And I think that we underestimate how fast that, that might be in terms of creating intelligent machines. Um, Roland, would you leave us this possibility, at least this one, if we cannot do it biologically? Uh, well, that is, uh, I don't have a whole lot to add <laughs> to uh, Steve's profound uh, <laughs> ideas about this. Um, I, I, I'm, I think that you know, my arguments earlier on, on um, that you have to... Uh, let's say, view everything in the light of evolution still would pertain to the fact that um, we are probably n now not going to be here uh, f forever. And, um, and I think one of the next questions is going to be, can we actually escape the evolutionary doom that every other species, almost every other species has, uh, has experienced? 99.9%. 99, uh, except for a few... Uh, uh, examples um, is that uh, yeah we're probably not uh, going to be able to uh, to survive. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. well, we obviously cannot end on this note. So I will <laughs> I will ask Ashok. So assuming that Stephen is right and we will be able to prolong our life and uh, setting up a dialogue here. Also <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, and, and prolong it for a long period of time. So going back to the physical limits of what is possible. So the way I understand what's going to happen, and you will correct me if I'm right, is that uh, eventually all the galaxies, because the universe is accelerating, uh, expansion is accelerating, all the galaxies will uh, be far enough so that they will not be able to communicate and be completely invisible. So we're stuck with one galaxy, so Milky Way, with, uh, you know, 100 billion stars. Well, and maybe then a few more around it. Yeah, a few yeah. more yeah. small ones uh, around it. And then uh, the rest of them will disappear from our view, so everything will simplify in a way. And then, uh, and then the stars will basically shut down one by one. The new ones will not... Uh, 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 will not emerge, and uh, and things will kind of start happening this way. And then, how can you sort of describe the uh, uh, the next phase? <laughs> well, I I don't know that there will really be a next phase. I mean, <laughs> I think the ten that is, uh, ten to the thirteen to ten to the fourteen years is probably the maximum limit that you can really survive. And but this is the energy limit. Mm -hmm. This is the uh, energy limit, yeah. Bec we will basically run out of energy, exactly. Now, uh, so this is kind of the hard stop. I would think so. And then, <laughs> and then uh, but I also understand, uh, just from your recent publication, which I found very interesting, that 
Um, there are these other terrible things that can happen to us even before that, <laughs> uh, the so-called death bubble. So can you explain us what that is and how will it work? OK, yeah. I think, uh, I mean, those of you who had been to Kamran Wafa's talk, he explained it very well uh, in the afternoon, but maybe I can say it again. So I think what has emerged from our recent studies in string theory, as well as several experimental discoveries, like the discovery of dark energy or accelerating universe, for example, the measurement of the Higgs mass, okay, all of these seem to hint to the possibility that the universe that we are living in is metastable. Okay, so let me explain what metastable means. So a metastable universe is like a supercooled liquid. Okay, so imagine that you have a glass of water which you have supercooled. Okay, you have reduced the temperature below zero degree. Now, if you can really keep it undisturbed for a long time, it will remain as it is. Okay, it will uh, remain as water. But if you create a small disturbance, say if there is a small impurity or you shake it a little, then what will happen is that suddenly some pocket of ice will form in maybe one small pocket, and then the ice will start expanding because that's a more stable phase. And then eventually the whole glass of water will become ice. Okay. So when we say that our universe is metastable, this is the kind of universe we are living in, that we are living for a long time. Okay, we know that we have lived for 14 billion years. Okay. However, if there is, it, is, it is possible that there will be some small quantum disturbance in some part of the universe, which will create a more stable phase. Okay. And then that part of the universe will start expanding. Okay, so that's what uh, you would refer to as the death bubble. Okay. And it expands at the speed of light, and it basically destroys all of us, okay, immediately. I mean, it because there are different laws inside it. Yeah, because basically, the, even the particles like electrons and protons, which make us, don't exist inside. Okay, so it's a completely different phase of the universe, and there is no way we can survive. Okay. Now the question is, how probable is this? Okay, can it happen tomorrow? Okay, and yes, indeed, it can happen tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> And the uh, point is that we, if it happens tomorrow, we'll have no advance warning because the wall expands at the speed of light. So we know about it when it reaches us. Okay. However, the probability that it will happen tomorrow is uh, very small. I mean, you can say that it's less than one in a trillion because we have lived for uh, uh, 14 billion years. And based on that, you can estimate of what is the probability. Okay. But this also suggests that if the probability is really like one in uh, a few billions, okay, which is all you can say. It's less than one in a few billions, but it could be as large as one in a few billions. Okay. Then we cannot really live for 10 to the 14 years. We'll, one of these bubbles will hit us before we reach that limit. Okay, and now the question is, is, that, is there something that you can do about it? <laughs> now, if you had asked this question 20 years ago, okay, the answer would have been clearly that no, there is nothing that you can do about it. However, again, the discovery of dark energy, okay, or this accelerating expansion of the universe does provide a way out, okay, which is again from Sol. And so the idea is the following, that yes, it is so true this that- one, one person in the room gave us hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is that indeed, when a bubble like this forms, it st starts expanding at the speed of light. Okay. But the acceleration of the universe can win over that uh, expansion. Okay. So while the bubble expands at the speed of light, the universe expands. Okay. And sufficiently far away regions of the universe will not be reached by this expanding bubble. Okay, so there can be, it, it's possible that some part of the universe will still be left untouched. Okay. And if we could somehow live on those, those regions, okay, then we will be safe because at least the one bubble will not be able to kill us. Okay. Now the question is how do we ensure that we live on those regions? Okay, because we have no idea where the bubble will form. It's a quantum fluctuation which forms a bubble. So what we could possibly do is the following, okay, that imagine that we are here today, okay, and say in the next million years, we spread over a large distance, okay. In fact, I mean, we, we have to spread over a distance scale that is beyond our, uh, the scale of our galaxy. So we have to go at least, say, five, 10 million light years away from us, okay. And suppose we establish colonies in these different corners of the universe. In, other, in other galaxies. Other, in other galaxies, okay. In fact, it has to go out of the local uh, cluster. Okay, so that means at least five to 10 million light years. And then the expansion of the universe will slowly pull us apart. Okay. And at some point, we'll be so far apart and we'll be accelerating us so fast from each other that we'll basically lose all the communication. Okay. There is no way that we can send a light signal from us to reach another uh, of these universes and, or another of the civilizations. Okay. But that would also mean that if one of these bubbles are, is created near us, 
Okay, it can destroy us, but it will not be able to destroy these other civilizations, which are far away from us. Now, of course, there can be other bubbles which are created in other parts of the universe, which will eventually destroy them. Okay, but what we achieve in this uh, way is that we can increase the effective life expectancy. Okay, that uh, it's not. I mean, if we take the combined uh, life expectancy of all the civilizations, okay, one or more may survive for much longer than what we would have been if there was only one copy of the civilization. But 10 to the 14 is a hard stop. 10 to the 14 is a hard stop. And then between now and 10 to the 14, that's the way we can escape. Because if there is one bubble destroys everybody in one pocket, then in another pocket that will already spread, we would continue to survive. Exactly. That's right. OK. Until there's a hard stop. Exactly. Yeah. All right. <laughs> On that note, I mean, this, this could have been our last panel, but I think we have <laughs> one more panel to go. I'm, I'm actually more concerned whether we survive the next four years here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now, thank you very much. So our next, <laughs> our next panel, I would like to Thank you. Uh, Huda Zogby is uh, is neurogeneticist at Baylor College of Medicine. She has found genetic mutations responsible for two rare new neurodegenerative diseases which also promises to impact our understanding of more common diseases like Parkinson's. Nimar Kani Hamed is a theoretical physicist at the Institute of Advanced Study. He is one of the leading experts in particle physics, string theory, and extra dimensions. Um, yeah, we did not talk about extra dimensions yet, but maybe we'll have a chance. And uh, Harry Noller is a biochemist at UC Santa Cruz. He was the first to show that RNA plays an active role in the chemical reactions involved in gene expression. And uh, what we're discussing is the evolution of intelligence. So Huda, what do you understand by intelligence? Let's start with that. So it's a loaded term with hidden features. Um, sensing, you have to sense things in the environment. Integrating, you integrate all the sensory information you have around you. Planning, based on what you've seen and integrated. Judging, taking risk, weighing risk versus a, uh, reward. And Adapting. These are just at least few things. I think you have to have them, and that will determine how intelligently you're surviving your environment. And of course, this is constantly in interaction with the environment. As physical changes happen, chemical changes happen, biological, even social. You you know, it's a multi-dimensional optimization problem that you have to constantly being weighing trade-offs what to do. So it's really you know, quite complex and has many components. And of course, um, if you are doing that in an environment where you're adapting very well, everything is going great, no change is necessary. Mutations happen uh, when, there's a, you know, when there's a need for a change because something changed in your environment and for you to survive, mutations will happen and there'll be selection. But if there is no need for that, those mutations will be selected against. So that's why there are a lot of animals like sharks that existed for many millions of years. And because their environment is stable, they Perfect. don't evolve uh, right. further intelligence, however intelligent they are today. Exactly. They are okay. at the top and they're fine. But if their environment might change. Then we're going to start seeing, right. The, you know, there'll be mutations and those that will give them now advantage to sense and integrate the information in their environment and so on and so forth, they're going to survive. What specifically changed in our environment so that we were so fortunate? Well, there are quite few things. I think that uh, things that were selected for, for us to perhaps reach the intelligence that we have 
Today, I would think they happen both within the brain and outside the brain. So uh, within the brain, uh, obviously, let, let's take outside the brain because I think that's probably important. Um, you know, having opposable thumbs is a mutation that has happened that gave us strength, and then we could now start using tools in our environment, building tools, right, that would allow us to change. Um, so I, I think of really changes happening for you to adapt so that you can survive, so you can now maybe eat meat. If you have tools, you can hunt, you can do things, and that may give you carnitine, better mitochondria, you're going to be smarter, and so on and so forth. Okay. That's one example. Uh, Harry, uh, the basic molecules of life that you have studied all your life, they seem to be able to process some information. So how do we get from that to something that can be called intelligence? Well, uh, I would agree with uh, Huda's first comment that intelligence is a loaded term. I would say that <coughs> if the bacteria were on this panel, <laughs> they might uh, argue that they're, they're much smarter than we are because if we're measuring it by survival, they're by far, archaea and bacteria are far more successful biologically than humans. And they would say, why do you need all those cells and arms and legs and cars and so on? <laughs> uh, so I think the bacteria, uh, and I think this was commented on earlier a couple of times today, uh, and, and unicellular organisms are already responding to their environment and sensing their environment and uh, using flagella and so on for moving around according to uh, the stimuli that they get from the environment. Um, and you could say, if, if we want to now shift to our intelligence, uh, then you can imagine a series of, of steps where you uh, elaborate on this from your sensory information and, as Huda is saying, integrating it and, um, and so on, uh, and evolving from single cells. Well, in, in, our, in our development, of course, we start out as a single cell, and during our development, uh, our brains develop, and you can imagine uh, a similar scenario for the development of, of the human brain. Um, um, and then why, I mean, I, I, I wonder about the effect of environment on the evolution of, of, of uh, human intelligence since, um, in spite of living in many different environments during our evolution over the last few hundred thousand years, humans are remarkably similarly intelligent, uh, the different uh, races that have dispersed around the globe, whereas there are other physical uh, attributes have diverged. Um, and what I would suggest is that maybe the main driving force for the increase in human intelligence is other humans, that we're competing uh, for our survival, that is our genetic survival, the, our ability to procreate and so on, and um, by outwitting our, our fellow humans. <laughs> uh, Nima, let's just test uh, on a shorter time scales, let's say a few hundred years, let's take uh, famous scientists uh, like Newton or Galileo, and if you compare sort of their intelligence to some of the physicists that re lived recently or even in this room. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, uh, do you think we became more or less intelligent just judging? I'm not looking at any of my specific colleagues, <laughs> okay, when I'm saying that. Um, well, uh, first of all, um, uh, Newton was a freak 
uh, once a millennium freak. So let's put New Newton aside. I think. Well, it's, what uh, do you mean by this? Well, I mean uh, Newton got up in the morning and just decided to calculate the square root of two to, dec to twenty decimal places for fun. Uh, the Newton was uh, was. Uh, I think there was something biologically different about him. Um, uh, so so you mean I really that don't want to talk about Newton. That's, <laughs> that's quite, quite depressing. <laughs> but so do uh, you mean that he was probably the smartest scientist uh, ever lived? Well, by any reasonable measure of that word, I think it's, 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 it, it's true. And, and I, I don't think it's just that we're turning him into a saint. He was most certainly not a saint. But, uh, um, uh, but really, let's, let's, let's put Newton aside. Apart from, <laughs> Newton, <laughs> apart from Newton, I think it's, uh, uh, at least my, my, my own feeling is, that, that of course, that there's, more seriously, that there's no reason to assume that there's any real, any real change in brain biology or anything like that on that kind of time scale. Uh, the main thing which has happened, obviously, is that we've, uh, we've managed to unleash the collective intelligence of uh, humanity uh, much more, uh, more and more as, uh, as the time goes on. And I think this is uh, largely a good thing. It's largely a good thing for science. Um, uh, it's largely a good thing for society um, in general. Um, it has some interesting bad side effects, I think. I mean, there are some, uh, uh, it is interesting to compare the sort of kind of progress we're making now to what was accomplished by the sort of leisure classes of Europe in the 1800s. And uh, they managed to discover an enormous number of things, partially because uh, science wasn't something professionalized, actually. I mean, they actually did it. Uh, they, they, they could afford to do it. It's something that they, they just wanted to spend their, 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 their lives doing. And that was less collective than it is now, even though it was relatively collective. There was some homogenization that happens when you have a large number of people who know what everyone else is thinking. And, uh, but anyway, that, 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 that's, that's an aside. I think that's the main difference between uh, now and then. And of course, we have better and better tools that help us uh, get rid of the grunge work more quickly and to focus on uh, uh, making it easier to dig out uh, data, both, of course, most obviously in experiments, but even, even in abstruse areas, uh, you know, esoteric uh, uh, pursuits in, in mathematics and theoretical physics, um, uh, there is a real sense of looking at data, theoretical data, uh, and, uh, and staring at it using uh, help from uh, computers to, uh, uh, to see patterns that would be hard to see otherwise and so on. So th those things have certainly changed. But apart from Newton, I don't think uh, uh, they were any smarter than us or any smarter than uh, them. Well, I cannot not ask you just one question about one of my heroes, Einstein. All right, so Einstein versus Newton. Oh, it's not close, actually, in my view. I mean, it's not the, the maybe many people, I don't know, if, uh, I don't know, we, we could poll my uh, theoretical <laughs> physicist colleagues. Uh, I don't think it's actually particularly close. I mean, Newton, we are all doing what Newton told us to do uh, for <laughs> years ago. He invented what we do. Um, it's, it's very different than, uh, uh, it's very different than, than taking gigantic, massive leaps uh, uh, within this well fairly well-defined uh, sort of framework of, uh, of, of, of theoretical science in, in, in particular. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, Einstein is second, but... Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, but, uh, but definitely, I don't think it's particularly close. <laughs> um, uh, Huda, can genetic engineering improve human intelligence? So, going beyond just adaptation and of competition among ourselves. Right, right. Speeding up, maybe. Right. So, I, I go by data. And what I've learned from data that there are many genes, not one, because genetic engineers, that means we kind of have to manipulate a gene or a few genes, right, to make someone more intelligent. So, I think if you're taking a person, who's, as far as you know, does not have a major defect and you want to make them more intelligent, you're going to have to know what can you dial up. And today, we don't know of any one particular gene that you can dial up to make someone more intelligent. We know that you need the robustness of hundreds and maybe close to thousands of genes to be robust for your synapses to work well, for you to learn and remember and be intelligent. So that part, making somebody who, any person in this room, trying to make them more intelligent, we don't have a clue what to dial up. What we do know, though, in people who are unfortunate to have one of those few hundred or a thousand genes that are disrupted, and they are born with intellectual disability, I do imagine there will be a day where we can genetically 
engineer repair of the defect that's leading to that. I imagine that's feasible. There are few hurdles we have to overcome. Um, you know, we're going to have to get the machinery needed. We, we've heard today during the uh, day about the CRISPR, where you can really cut and paste, basically. Well, I think we need to get over the hurdle of getting the enzyme in the, all the brain cells that where you have to get it in. So that's how I think of genetic engineering as of our knowledge today. Now, if between now and five years or 10 years, somebody discovers the critical gene that you can dial up and down, then the answer would be yes. I think the one thing I would like to say though, because this is really important, we're always looking for the fanciest way to increase intelligence. And I think the public health data, Michael Marmot presented that, and th that graph, I would never forget that graph. The public health data tell us you can be born with a superb IQ, but if you grow in a place where you're not stimulated, where you're deprived, poverty, lack of education, within a few years, your IQ will drop 20 points. On the the reverse of that, if you're born with a low IQ, but put in a nurturing, highly stimulating environment, you can gain. So there's 20 points in IQ that can go up and down based on just the environment. So I think we should not forget that before we jump to the, you know, the genetic engineering. Absolutely. Harry, does our biological heritage limit how intelligent we can become even in principle? What do you think about that? I mean, we have certain size and certain number of neurons and... Yeah, well, I can't speak for the theoretical physicists, <laughs> but uh, my own feeling about my own brain is that it is a, a single processor that uh, people talk about multitasking. I, I question our ability to do multitasking, uh, talking on the phone while you're driving your car at 75 <laughs> miles an hour uh, on the East Shore Freeway. Or, um, and so m one possibility is that we could figure out how to have multiple processors in the human brain. Uh, so. When, when we do crystallographic computations and we use uh, maybe machines with eight or 16 processors. And so imagine humans doing parallel processing, uh, reading a book while you're solving uh, uh, equations. So you think it can be biologically possible to... Well, I'm, no, I'm, no, I'm no neurobiologist, so I, mean I would have to defer to the experts. Uh, actually it's to the contrary, the multitasking. In fact, you think you're multitasking, but you're actually missing a lot of things that are happening around you. So that's what all the data have shown in many studies, right? So, uh, but I think with a little bit of artificial in interface, if you can sort of somehow get smart enough to couple some computational uh, assistance, then maybe we can be multitasking more safely and more sort of seriously. A, isn't there, a, I mean, I, my ignorance of uh, neurobiology is, is coming out here, but isn't there there's sort of a, an integrating center in the brain that's the sort of seat of consciousness, isn't it? Uh, in fact, I don't think we know really where that uh -huh. is. <laughs> I, I <laughs> wish we knew. It seems to be that we, you know, that we don't have two... I, uh, uh, I, I, I think... Right. I mean, I think that it's really the attention. It's an issue of an attention yeah, exactly. that we don't have. That's right. What I'm right. And so if we could create a second uh, uh, attention device. Uh, if we can split, right, yeah. have tracks for attention that could be done, that, that could be. But as of now, we don't have that, right? Well, already spoke about the um, sort of what can an individual do to try to extend his own life. I would ask the same question, what can we do, maybe changing lifestyle or something, that would uh, increase our capability to be intelligent, or maybe uh, slow down the degradation? 
So I think, again, there are some data, because you, it, it comes back to your earlier question to Steve, you know, is there anything we can do to live right. better? I think living longer is not good if you're not, you know, with your all your faculties. You want to live longer and with a healthy brain. And I think the data on that have really identified a few things besides the Mediterranean type of diet, the exercise, social interaction is really important. And I think the, the, the activity within the day, the diversity of the activity is really important. So this is something elderly people who are in their 90s who are constantly, you know, seeing friends every day, interacting, do remarkably better, whereas people who retire and are isolated, their you know, capacity goes down quite a bit. So I think these are the things that are really, at least the studies show they have. I have my own additional things. I think trauma is horrible for the aging brain. So do everything in your power to avoid trauma, even peripheral trauma, because I think it might produce inflammation which for a vulnerable brain could even, you know, accelerate. Even trauma damage. of the head. Trauma of the head is bad, but even in the elderly, peripheral trauma can actually cause someone to deteriorate. And I think part of that is inflammation, perhaps. So I think these are the really the major th stress. It's a U-shaped curve for stress. No stress is sort of not quite so good. And too much stress is really bad. I mean... There are many data that show the uh, corticotropic releasing hormone can really kill dendrites, can kill synapses if you have too much of it. So again, balancing that. And I think sleep is probably still, you know, ambiguous. I'm not so sure what the data are on sleep, but all the others, I think the data are there. So sort of average number of stress, not too good, not too bad. Right. Yeah. And uh, before I ask the last Nima, the last question. Um, is there any convincing data that scientists live longer? Um, well, I mean, they have right. mental activity and... Right. I, th I think that, I mean, their data, of course, on the nuns, that the long studies that have happened that show that those that, you know, were wrote better when they were in school earlier years. They had a much better, longer half life, uh, longer lives. I'm not so sure that, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so sure about scientists living longer outside of the same area that we've talked about. I mean, m the longest lived scientist I know is Michael DeBakey who lived up to a hundred years. Mm -hmm. And what Michael did, he was very active. He never sat idle. He ate the Mediterranean diet. He, he did caloric restrict, I would say, to a certain degree, not too much. But, I mean, he really did all the things that most of these people that live, that have the long life do. But I don't know that any particular scientist have had a, a specific advantage. Maybe well. if they don't exercise and they eat a bad diet, it <laughs> might cancel their inte intelligent life. Well, Nima, what do you think about you know, augmenting our brain with uh, some sort of computer intelligence and elements of AI. Um, do you think we will be able to do better science or maybe eventually even computers can do better science? What do you think about that? I think I'm Depending supposed to say on no to the answer <laughs> to this question, right? That, that, uh, that, uh, that, 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 that that computers won't be able to replace. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to realize unique, that uh, this is the last. Human creative, uh, yeah. This right. is the last question of today. So just think about what you. Uh. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I actually, I have something, I think I have something relatively optimistic to say about this, although I'm not sure. I mean, uh, I think I'm, I'm uh, we're, uh, as, a, as a theoretical physicist, I'm probably supposed to say, uh, I'm probably supposed to say, um, the standard thing to say is if we knew uh, how to pose problems sharply enough to give it to a computer, or even imagine programming an algorithm or something that would do it. Would would that it were our life was so easy? And uh, and most of the most interesting problems are ones that we can just barely start to articulate sharply enough so that we can work on them. Ninety nine point nine 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 percent of uh, of the struggle in making progress 
sure in all of science, but certainly in our part of science, is coming up with the right questions, uh, uh, struggling around in the dark, getting greatly aided by the structure of the answer. <laughs> um, uh, so all these things are, they seem so, so uh, ineffable, so human, et cetera, et cetera, that, uh, that it seems hard to imagine doing it. And I think that's a sort of a cliche thing, thing uh, cliche standard thing, thing to say. Um, uh, it's, when I think about it a little more, it's a little bit l less uh, obvious. Um, uh, well, first of all, occasionally uh, you see little cool things. Like I think there was a, a few months ago, there was a, there was a, a something out of Cornell. I think maybe it was last year. I don't remember where they just uh, they 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 had a computer program just look at the motion of all kinds of uh, simulated objects, pendulums, blocks, inclined planes, and stuff like that. And after staring at this for a long time, it figured out the law of conservation of energy. Okay, just from staring at the pattern. So that 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 sounds that sounded exciting. Until you looked at, at least to me, until you looked at what they fed it, which is look for equations that might be true. <laughs> you know, uh, that, I mean, that was the huge insight that human beings had 400 years ago that you should even go about looking for huge equations that that, that might be true. Um, so once you once you ask, once you make things uh, specific enough that uh, that uh, uh, that that you can imagine giving an algorithm again, uh, would that it were our life was uh, so easy? It, it isn't like that. But um, on the other hand, I think that there is a uh, there's there's something also off about this idea of a of a flash of uh, completely unexplained genius uh, pulling out an answer out of nowhere. Um, uh, many many of the really great advances in uh, in in science, when you really look at the at, at the literature, when you look at what people were doing, it's just many 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 little incremental steps, and they can end up telling you a story. Uh, about why they did what they did. It's just that they, they took a hundred or a thousand incremental steps along the way and you just see the uh, final result uh, at the end. Um, uh, in fact, part of the interesting thing is, is certainly in, in physics is that what, what ends up having a chance of being true are interesting stories and you keep trying out, could it be this story, could it be that story, could it be that story. It doesn't have a, doesn't have a, a linear progression but you sort of try whole narratives and see if whole narratives work. Um, but it does have an incremental feeling to it. I think it's actually, and an, an it's, it's inspiring to know that even the greatest accomplishments, the invention of general relativity, invention of quantum mechanics, I'd spent some time looking at Heisenberg's original paper where he invented quantum mechanics, and he does these completely irrational things in the middle of the paper, just looking for formal similarities <laughs> between uh, the pattern of uh, spectra emitted from atoms and the motion of uh, particles. And uh, there are all sorts of in intermediate steps that make no logical sense, but he's looking for a formal structure, a kind of a pattern that might, might make sense. Uh, and it's very incremental, very, 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 very incremental. I could imagine you might be able to teach. Uh, uh, we certainly can't imagine doing it now. At least I certainly can't imagine doing it now. But it's not completely insane that you might be able to teach uh, a machine to do something like that in some uh, distant future. Um, uh, so then I, I see two possibilities. One of them is that uh, we, teach, uh, we teach computers how to do this and they just figure out the laws of nature better than we do. And uh, hopefully they're kind to us and even here there are two sub-possibilities. One of them is that they keep coming back dutifully and telling us what they found, <laughs> which would be really, really nice and wonderful, although we'd feel a little <laughs> deprived. Uh, the other one would be they would sit and think about the black hole information paradox for, what was it, uh, 40 years and say, no, we still don't got it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> they're obviously better than we are, but they're, they're, they're still stuck. So that would be pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty depressing. Um, I think much more likely, uh, much, much, much more likely, just given the uh, uh, amazing adaptability humans have shown over thousands of years, uh, is that we'll do what we've done with every other tool we've ever invented. I don't, I mean, we're in a very interesting moment in the development of humanity, but I don't think it's an especially singular moment in some, on the sort of thousand year time scale. We've done the sort of thing before. We've had huge advances, we adapt to it. And uh, I think it's much more likely that there'll be an interesting uh, human machine uh, interface and that, uh, uh, and that we'll, We'll, we'll just use it better and better, and this great plasticity that we've had, this great adaptability, the power of abstraction, all the things that we've been very good at, I see no reason why it won't uh, uh, continue to be the case and, uh, and, and, and hopefully lead us to uh, 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 making many of these breakthroughs that people are prognosticating about. Well, I want to thank all our panelists today. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs>